If you are a plant parent, you are also likely a plant killer. Although I call myself a plant killer turned happy plant lady, I actually don't love the term plant killer because it insinuates that we did it on purpose. But we all know if you have killed a plant, that is so far from the truth. Having a plant die under your care can be totally soul crushing. We bring this plant home. We spend a bunch of money on it. We are full of hope that this plant is going to bring us joy, make our homes look beautiful. And then due to what could be a myriad of circumstances, wrong environment, forgetting about it, too much travel, or just not understanding how to care for it, the plant dies and we are filled with shame. I cannot tell you how many times I have been somewhere and when the person I'm talking to finds out that I have a podcast about houseplants, I immediately see their face fall, their eyes dart away, and they say, well, I need your show because I can't keep a plant alive if someone paid me. Yes, they mean this as a joke, but there is an underlying pain there, a failure that they feel silly about. We all know this feeling, right? But the plant community likes to be focused on sometimes seemingly impossible standards of plant perfection instead of the realities of, hey, plants die. Hey, plants have brown leaves. You win some, you lose some, right? This is a hobby. We're not all experts. But guess what? Even if your plants have died in your care, you are still worthy and there's no need to carry shame about it. So today we dive deep into all the feels about plant death, how to deal with it, tools and strategies for moving on. So welcome and let's grow some joy, shall we? Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Plant friends, welcome to the first episode of the Growing Joy podcast and the 172nd episode of the podcast formerly known as Bloom and Grow Radio. Happy New Year. I hope you've had beautifully planty starts to the new year. For new listeners who are coming and experiencing the Growing Joy podcast for the first time, welcome. For the longtime listeners who formerly knew the show as Bloom and Grow Radio and are now seeing our updated podcast art, hearing our new jingle, welcome to the new improved rebranded show. Show. I like to say it's a new name, it's new art, but it's the same heart. It is the same heart that have brought you Bloom and Grow Radio in 2017, but we're expanding and unfurling. So in 2023, we're going to be bringing you four episodes a month. Two of those episodes will be focused on plant care, indoor and outdoor, and then two will be focused on self-care through the lens of plants and community. So when I was thinking about how to kick off this season and examining what it really means to be a plant parent and what we all experience collectively as a community, as a global international community, when I was thinking about these plant parent experiences, yes, I thought about you know, the win of getting your orchid to rebloom, the amazing taste of a homegrown tomato, the thriving Hoya collection that blooms for the first time. Yes, those all, you know, bond us as plant parents, but what bonds us even more is the feeling you get when you kill the plant. We all know that disappointment, that shame, that sadness. And I almost feel like we're bonded together through our plant fails even more than we're bonded together through our wins from my experience in speaking with other plant parents. So when I decided that I wanted to do an episode on plant fails or, you know, what to do when you kill a plant, I knew that today's guest, Cassidy, from the very well-known blog and succulent resource and brand Succulents and Sunshine, would be the perfect guest for this conversation on plant death because she's kind of a two-for-one. Not only is she a plant expert, she's a plant parent, she's built a wildly successful company about caring for succulents, but (laughs) she specifies in succulents. And if you know, you know succulents are so hard to keep alive, but succulents are also, for some reason, it's fake news. They're widely known as these easy to care for plants, but they're actually really hard to care for. And I've seen so many people bring a succulent home thinking that they're hard to kill, 
kill the succulent because it's really hard to keep them alive indoors if you don't have enough light and then label themselves as a plant killer and never try again. I know because personally I did this for the majority of my 20s back in the day when I was an epic plant killer. So Cassidy has so much to share on this topic. I personally have a lot to share on this topic because we all know I've been there. My plant graveyard is, is very large. But I think the beauty of this conversation is that yes, we're talking about something negative and something shameful, but we share so many tools and tactics and perspectives that hopefully can help you move through whatever plant fail you might be experiencing. So I hope you love Cassidy as much as I do and that this, you know, conversation leaves you feeling seen and inspired as much as it did for me. Cassidy, welcome to the Growing Joy podcast. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. We have a little bit of a beautiful background noise of your fancy 3D printers (laughs) for your snappy pots. I love it. They started beeping right as we started counting down. (laughs) That's so funny. Yes, they have taken over my life and my recording studio. So they've got a little quiet hum in the background, hopefully. I love it. Well, because I just mentioned your snappy pots before we dive into our conversation today. Do you want to give a brief introduction to our audience of everything succulents and sunshine? Yes, I'd love to. So I run the website Succulents and Sunshine. We teach people how to grow succulents, even if you don't live in the perfect climate, which I really never have. And most people don't. So it's been really fun. I teach mostly how to grow indoors um, through our blog, our YouTube channel. And then um, just in the last year, we released a line of pots designed for succulents. And those are snappy pots. And they work for other plants too. And we actually have some snappy boxes for non-plant lovers, but they have little decorations that you can swap out and change out throughout the year, which is super fun. Yeah, so I've been growing succulents and teaching how to grow them for a little over 10 years. And I love it. I wouldn't change it for the world. Yeah, you've built such an amazing brand. And I have to share this kooky story of how we've almost crossed multiple times multiple years ago. And this was, I think, right when I was starting my podcast, formerly known as Bloom and Grow Radio. I was having imposter syndrome and some like doubts about whether or not I should do it. And I'm a huge fan. Shout out Pat Flynn. We both love Pat Flynn. We're followers of Pat Flynn. You were a guest on his podcast and he interviewed you about being in the niche of succulents. And I remember hearing your story on this podcast and hearing how you built this incredible brand, this unbelievable business built off of succulents, which was even more of a niche than what I wanted to build you know, my podcast around. And I remember feeling so inspired by your story cut to, you know, years later, maybe six months ago, I got a random, you know, message from my website and it was you asking me if I would come speak to your community because you have a community. And I remember getting like full body shivers, you know, those like goosebumps that you get being like, oh my God, this is a wild, like universe given, like full circle moment that was just like, I think when I responded to you, it was like in all caps because I was just like, I cannot believe you're reaching out to me right now when you were one of, you were this moment of me listening to this podcast being like, yes, if she can do it, I can do it. And now like we have worked together and we're friends. It's like so wild to me. Yes. Well, and I, I feel like it was the same for me when I heard your interview with Pat, which is when I reached out to you, I was trying to think of people that would be a great fit to share with our succulent lovers club. And I was driving somewhere probably for like a holiday, going to visit family and heard your interview. And I'm like, we need to have Maria come talk. Like everything just resonated. And it's been so fun that we've gotten to be friends since then. Yeah, truly. So thank you, Pat Flynn. And any other plantrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, you should definitely go check out everything Pat has to offer. He's got a great podcast, Smart Passive Income, and I've been a member of his community for multiple years as well. His community was actually a huge inspiration for mine. But also, you know, as we've rebranded and moving into growing joy and exploring the experience of wellness through the lens of plants, I was thinking about really wanting to do an episode on, you know, the concept of plant death and plants dying. And you came to mind because I feel like from the moment we've met, we have such deep conversations immediately. And so I was like, well, you could come on and teach succulents or you could come on and we could talk about death and like really heady kind of more deep spiritual stuff. So I'm excited that you're you're down for this conversation. (laughs) 
Yes. I love it. It's like the anti teaching, right? It's like, I can teach you how to keep plants alive, or I can tell you all the ways that they can die and why it's okay. (laughs) Right. And why it's okay if you kill your plants. And I think too, you know, you are a succulent expert. For me, I feel like part of my job as a, you know, houseplant person is saying, debunking the myth that succulents are easy to take care of. Everyone thinks, oh, I'm a plant killer. I've, I can't even keep a succulent alive. And I'm like, I'm a plant enthusiast, arguably a plant expert, and I still can't keep succulents alive. Like succulents are hard to keep alive. So if you're in the succulent space, you're definitely probably going to have killed a plant or two. If you're in the house plant space, if you are a plant parent, plant death is part of the journey. It's not, you know, a negative thing. Well, it, it can be negative, but it's not something that is only reserved for bad plant parents and on the heels of coming out of the pandemic, when I think a lot of people got really into plants and really expanded their collections. Now we're getting more active. We're leaving our homes a little bit more. We're a little bit more distracted. I think it's very normal. A lot of people are kind of entering different seasons of life and and maybe losing interest in their plants or maybe getting overwhelmed and needing to part with a few. And you can make it mean a lot about you. What's your take on how plant parents can, can really take plant death so personally? Well, I think it's because you put so much time and effort into something, right? And it's not like, I think for most people, it's not like they just set a plant there and just expect it to live on its own. Like they're learning about it. They're putting time and effort and love into this thing. And then to have it die, it's kind of like this slap in the face, like, wait, what? But I, I did my best and I tried. And so I think it becomes really personal. And we've talked about a lot how you know, plants are kind of a reflection of us personally too. So I think when we see a plant die, we almost feel like there's this little part of us that died too, you know, whether it's because we put in all that time and effort or because we connected or related to that plant in some way and now it's dead. And so it feels like, you know, part of us is dying too. There's a a lot of different ways I think that that applies. Yeah. And that sense of failure. I don't think any of us like to, you know, I think both of us have kind of talked about our struggles with people pleasing offline and, you know, that sense of failure that you can feel, you know, you want to do the right thing. You want to have the photos on Instagram. You want to, you want to look like the Pinterest photos that you're pinning. And, you know, you want your plants to look the way they look when they're in a garden center and you come home and then all of a sudden you feel like you failed the plant, but failed yourself. But before we dive so deep, I think we should start by blowing up our own spots. Everybody's killed a plant. So I thought it would be fun for us to start with our own plant fail, plant, you know, death stories, just to kind of let you know, you know, listeners, there's really no shame in, you know, whatever, whatever, I always say, whatever weird thing you've done to your plant, I've probably done it. And I've probably done something even weirder. So I was thinking it'd be fun to start with, you know, a fun plant failure too. So do you have a a recent one or a memorable one you want to share? Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up 
like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. Oh, recent and memorable, for sure. So you talked about, you know, coming out of the pandemic, how a lot of people have maybe a lot more plans than they can take care of, or, you know, it's just, it's gotten to be a lot. And while I have always had a lot of plants, this season in my life, I have too many plants for the amount that I'm able to put in and take care of them. And the one that just like drove home to me that I need to reduce my plant number is I had a really, really beautiful Echeveria succulent. So it's like this purple rosette and it got mealy bugs and I treated it a couple times and it just, it kept getting them and it kept getting them. I could never quite eradicate it. And I went out of town for two or three weeks and came back and it was just covered. It was like, it grosses me out to think about it. And it just went the whole thing into the trash. Thankfully, it was in a pot that I could get rid of because I think the whole soil was infested. So it just made that walk of shame to the trash and I had to throw it away. And it just drove home for me. Like I need to be able to pay attention to my succulents and give them a little bit more attention and care than I currently am because that wouldn't have happened if I was checking in on it more frequently or if I only had 200 instead of 400 or, you know, like if there were less of them, I could catch it sooner and I could eradicate it faster. So that's been a big one for me. It's just, I feel like most of my recent plant deaths are like, Oh, I wasn't paying attention here and this one kind of slipped under the radar and, you know, it, it did not make it, but that one made me so sad because it was, it was such a beautiful plant like three, four months ago and sadly did not survive. (sighs) RIP. How do, how do you feel like, what's your approach to like deciding when it's time to toss versus when it's time to try treating again? Yeah. Mealybugs, I will say more and more if something has an infestation or if I'm pretty sure it has like an infection, I'm leaning towards like just getting rid of it. Maybe part of that's because I'm trying to reduce my plant number, but usually if it's like one or two little bugs and you can see them and the plant is still looking normal, there's not a lot of distortion to it. I think you're totally fine to treat it. And one of the big things I think that people miss is you've got to treat the plant, but you also need to treat the soil and then isolate it. So I know, I know one thing that I'm guilty of with this one is I did not isolate it. And so I've noticed a couple mealybugs have shifted over to the plants around it, but they still look healthy. So I'm just treating those and making sure I treat the soil and paying closer attention to them. But I think there's this tipping point where if it's just a couple little, you know, couple little mealy bugs, it's a lot easier to treat. Whereas if the whole stem is coated in them, like this one was, and it, oh, it's so bad. At that point, I think you just toss it. It's not worth the risk to your other plants, even if you're isolating and you spend so much effort to, you know, treat and get rid of the mealy bugs that I think it can end up just damaging the succulent or the plant as well. There's this this fine line between the treatment getting rid of the mealy bugs and doing damage versus the mealy bugs just doing damage and killing it. So there's a maybe a, a gray area, but I'd say if it's a, can- a handful, not a big deal. If it's completely covered, 
toss it and move on, get a new one. And you know, if you want, get a new one and try again. I think too, like from lessons learned, something I say all the time is, you know, don't have a watering routine, but have that plant care routine. So even if you have plants that you're not watering every week, like the importance of at least checking in with them once a week for those pests. And it sounds like that's exactly kind of what bumped you back. And that's something you know, right? We all know that. But you need that kind of knock over the head sometimes to kind of bump you back. I also feel like time is passing so quickly right now. Like I was talking with my husband this morning, like it just, I'm like, you know, we're recording this in December and I'm still like, where was August? That I think the beauty that plants can kind of give you is sometimes they do give you that opportunity to just kind of like knock you back into the present for a minute to be like, whoa, like I need to spend a little bit more time paying attention to these plants, but also if that's the case, there's probably other aspects of yourself in your life you have to pay attention to as well, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, and I think you talked about this in your book where like there is a perfect number for you, you know, perfect number of plants, but also that it does shift throughout your life, even maybe throughout the year. And I think that's what I've realized is actually during the pandemic, I needed a lot more plants so that I could show people more of what to do. But now that things have kind of slowed down a bit and I'm not as actively working on that, like forward facing, creating more videos. And now it's just coming down to caring for them. That's when I'm realizing, okay, now I need to cut back and just focus on the ones I really like, the ones that I know how to care for the best, the ones that grow best for me in my climate and not worry about all of the, you know, all the cool new rare ones that pop up. I've, I've realized too, I'm not a rare plant collector. I'm like, give me the basics. Give me the stuff that grows really well. That's not fussy. And I will do a lot better that way. Yeah, I think it's important too for people to know that even people like you who have literally had a business about succulents for 10 years, the size of your plant collection can ebb and flow. And you're actually being a good plant parent when you catch yourself in a moment when you're saying, oh, my collection has gotten too big to the point that I'm not caring for anything well because I don't have enough bandwidth. So it's actually in my best intention to you know, it's for the best if I reduce my plant collection in order to care for those, give, you know, 10 plants 100% instead of 100 plants 10%, you know? And that number, your plant number, it, it changes, you know? It changes in different seasons of life. Like I said earlier, like in the pandemic, I think everybody's plant numbers probably increased by about 25%. But that means that you might have to reduce your plant number by 25% as we kind of move back into... uh back into our faster paced world. Another thing you mentioned about when to toss versus when to treat, something I've noticed too is the emotional connection to the plant. So, you know, if you've been a member, if you've been a listener of my podcast, you know that I have had this lime tree since the beginning of my plant parenthood. And this poor thing, its name is Limey. His name is Limey. I rehomed him with my mom in Florida this year because he has just, we have put him through the ringer and like, he's a lime tree. He doesn't want to live indoors in New York city, right? Like that's just not, that's not where they're supposed to be. And it's interesting though, like Limey has been brought to the brink of death so many times. He's had scale, he's had spider mites, but the emotional connection there has made it so hard for me to let him go to the point that I literally brought him on a plane, flew, like applied for a visa like, Limey got a passport to fly to Florida. I had to apply to, with the Florida State of Agriculture, Department of Agriculture. And, you know, I did all of that because it felt good. But also, I think you do have to hit your moment where, you know, you're like, okay, I think I've done everything for this plant. And I think it's in everybody's best interest if we just move on. And when I rehomed Limey, when we set him up in my mom's house, he got leaf miners. And my mom was beside herself. She was like texting me every day. I realized I had projected, you know, she had like absorbed this stress that I was caring about this plant. And she was like, I don't know what to do, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I just kind of gave her permission. I was like, mom, it's okay if Limey doesn't make it. Like it was a great story. He's lived a great life. Like we've tried our best and, you know, I release the attachment to him needing to survive. And he's still surviving, but it was... It was an interesting lesson in seeing my emotional attachment and um, how healthy ver slash unhealthy it was, even if it did make for a really good story. 
Yes. I, there's been a number of plants, like either someone's given it to me or I got it for some special occasion or, you know, there's some sort of connection to it in that way. And it does make it a lot harder to let go of it. I know a lot of people, this is something kind of new to me, but like, I think the term someone used for it was like generational plant gifting where, you know, you get a jade plant from your grandmother or your you know parent and you want to pass it on to your children. That's a lot of pressure for a plant and for you. And there is a point where you know, a plant's not going to survive. Like hopefully, hopefully it will continue to grow or cuttings from it or whatever it may be. But I think it's really tricky when you put yourself in that position where it has to survive. Almost, I feel like a lot of times we end up doing too much for it and then it dies because we've been either over caring for it or fussing with it too much instead of just letting it grow and seeing what happens. Yeah. That actually reminds me, you shared your plant death. I'll share this plant death. So my grandma came over from Italy and grew sage every year in her front yard. My mom, when my grandma passed, dug up that sage, brought it, and my mom moved it from two homes. Um, And so we've had Nani sage in our homes. My parents moved to Florida. My mom dug some of the sage up and gave it to me. I moved to the woods and went through a really bad period of depression where I was not caring for my plants. And I had completely forgotten about the sage. We were also trying to keep it indoors because it was snowing and it was in a pot and the sage didn't make it. And the guilt that I carried for killing my grandma's sage plant, I mean, I didn't speak about it publicly. This is the first time I'm talking about it on the podcast. I didn't tell my mom for like eight months, you know, and it was painful. It it was shame. I carried so much shame about it. It was my grandma's heirloom. I call them heirloom plants, but I like generational plants too. But then, you know, I realized like my grandma is living through me in my dedication to plants and gardening in this. Like I feel her with me every day. I have a weird sense that I feel like she's like in the trees on my property, but my grandma's with me as I educate the world, you know, help the world like live vicariously through our plant collection. So is it so much about the sage or is it about the feeling of me being connected to my grandma? And how can I facilitate that feeling of connection instead of that attachment to this physical thing? That gets really deep. And I know it doesn't apply to everybody's scenarios, but um, especially with those heirloom plants, I think that's a very interesting kind of thing to look at and definitely some a very painful you know process that I went through this year. Yeah. And I think the idea that, like you were saying, like you felt so much shame and guilt around killing this plant. I don't think anyone wants that for someone they know, you know, whether they're alive and you gave them a plant or whether they've passed on. I don't think most of us don't want other people to feel terrible. And so, you know, buying a new one every couple months in their honor, you know, just thinking about it in a different way. I do think there's that part of us that wants to physically have some sort of token or a thing that we can remember them by. But I think you're totally right that it's really the spirit of it and just in their memory, continuing to care for other plants or do other things that that's where it really counts in my book. Yeah. And I think we can apply that to most of our plants, right? So we've kind of shared some of our, you know, our plant fails. And so let's get practical, right? So how can we turn a plant fail into a positive experience? And I think we've just hit on something that's really important. Can you recognize why you're feeling like a failure because of this plant, right? And figure out, okay, is there something deeper going on here? Like, is this a grandma thing or is this, am I really upset about the plant or am I really upset about whatever emotional attachment I have and how can I kind of transmute that into something else? But also like, what lessons can you learn, right? I learned with my grandma Sage, you can't, can't overwinter sage indoors after it's been living outside, even though, even however much you want to, like that's going to be very tricky. And if you're overwintering sage, you probably have to water it more than I did. What lessons have you learned from plant fails that you feel like you've been able to take to all of your collection? Yeah. So that mealybug experience, I think is one that comes up over and over where it's like, ah, I really need to be paying closer attention. And by closer attention, I don't mean like I need to be like inspecting every single plant every day, but just actually looking at them more closely, you know, instead of just like, oh, walking by, cool, they look good. But 
having that right number has been a big one for me, but also a big thing that I've learned is even within the world of succulents, not all succulents need the same amount of light, the same amount of water, the same temperatures. And so recognizing that each individual genus or species is going to have some variations as well as each individual like specimen. So I had two zebra plants. I had them in identical pots planted side by side, watered them the same amount, right? Because they look identical. And one of them did really, really well. And the other one didn't do super well, you know, and it's over time. But what I learned was one of them just put off a ton of roots really fast and it got a lot bigger. And then because the pot it was in, it was super, super root bound. It started rotting from the inside out because water kept getting trapped in the roots. So this other one that grew slower actually did better, whereas the one that grew fast didn't do as well because it ended up getting some rot inside and needed to be repotted. So I, I think that's what I keep coming back to is like every plant's a little bit different and yeah, it's okay if they don't, if it's okay if they don't all survive, but taking time to like learn that lesson and kind of look back and say, okay, what, what might I have done wrong that I can, you know, apply moving forward, which this doesn't quite apply in this moment, but something that I've also realized, I think most people forget is plants actually die in the wild too. <laughs> like we, I, <laughs> yeah, I, man, what I a think, great point. <laughs> right. I think we like look at nature and assume that everything lives for eternity. So I live right by the Saguaro national forest and I want to say it was two years ago, there was a news article that came out about how a ton of saguaros were dying because we'd had unusually humid weather and it was causing them to rot. You know, these are like hundreds of years old. It happens even if you're not doing anything. So I don't know, for me, that's kind of lightened the pressure too, but just for me, it comes down to, you can learn the lesson by just looking at what you've done and seeing what worked and then seeing what didn't work and trying to tweak and try again for the next one. Okay, plant fans, if you're looking to have a successful gardening season in 2023 and not kill all the plants in your garden, look no further than Territorial Seed Company. Territorial Seed Company's seed varieties are vetted by their experts to ensure that they're selling the seeds most likely to succeed. They have the most rigorous testing process for the seeds and plants that they sell. And if those seeds and plants, you know, survive the testing process, they sell them to us. And that shows that they're really vigorous, hardy plants. Plus, in those instances when the crops don't succeed that you've grown, they actually offer a 100% money-back guarantee. So you're literally insured success because you're either going to buy their plants, grow them, and have a great garden, or if they don't work out, you actually get a refund. It's wild. If you're looking for a quick win in the garden, one of their favorite crops to recommend beginning gardeners is the quick snack cucumber. Cucumbers in general tend to be a little bit easier to care for and grow, but this one is extra convenient because it can grow in a kitchen window. It's actually more low light tolerant, so it can grow in a kitchen window, it can grow on a kitchen countertop with a small grow light or out in your garden. It's smaller, it's so cute, but it's a very easy plant to grow for a wide amount of gardeners. And if you have, you know, only a windowsill, but you want to grow edibles, they actually have a whole kitchen counter line of small edible plants that you can grow in containers. Along with picking the right plants for your garden, it's also important to understand your soil. And Territorial Seed Company actually has a soil tester that you can use before the season starts, so you have time to make adjustments and amendments to your soil if you need it. They have everything you need, seeds, plants, a garden planner, all the seeds starting accoutrement you could dream of. So visit territorialseed.com slash growing joy for a 10% discount on everything on the website. So once again, territorialseed.com slash growing joy for 10% off. Winter is in full swing, plant friends, and if your plants are looking distinctly under the weather, maybe a little bit sad, it might be time to invest in some quality grow lights that will actually last and look beautiful next to your collection. As we have this episode on plant death, a huge part of plants dying is actually the owners not understanding that they don't have enough natural light in their homes for their plants to thrive 
I know this because I went through this. That's how I got to know Soltech Solutions five years ago when I realized that I had so much low light in my apartment. I found Soltech and installed a bunch of grow lights in my apartment and I was able to have like 160 plants thriving under I think five grow lights at that point. Soltech's range of full spectrum plant lights are sleek. They're modern. They'll look right at home in whatever decor you have. They're so sleek. They blend right in. No one ever knew that they were grow lights when they would come visit my house. You can choose from their pendant lights, their track lights, or grow bulbs that literally fit right into a standard light fixture. Whatever setup you have, they probably have the perfect fit for you. I started out with their pendant lights that I put in all of the corners of my home and then filled my corners with so many plants. I think I have three now. And then recently I used their Vita grow bulb in my desk lamp so I can have Hoya in my low light office. Soltech offers quality products built in America with outstanding customer service, free shipping, and a five-year warranty. You're not going to find that anywhere else. So get your own dose of personal sunshine, stay warm, feel better, and keep your plants thriving with Soltech. Check out Soltech.com and get 15% off your own grow light with code BLOOM15. Once again, that's Soltech.com, S-O-L-T-E-C-H, with code BLOOM15 for 15% off. Zooming out, like, And this is a lesson that I've learned over and over and over again in the last two years, personally, professionally, and with my plants. Perspective is the key to everything, every situation. There are so many different ways to look at it, and you have the choice to choose the perspective that you want to approach this with. So if we really zoom out, I love your example for the Saguaro National Forest. Also, oh my God, seeing saguaros in real life is like the most majestic, magical experience ever. Zooming out. Most of our houseplants and succulents are not designed to live in our homes. So a lot of the time, you know, Daryl Chang, one of my friends, houseplant journal, he always says, like, you don't kill the plant. The plant didn't make it under your environment. Like, you're not a plant killer. We're bringing these plants that are designed to live in 60 to 80 percent humidity. If you're a tropical foliage houseplant, succulents are a little different. But, you know, my collection My house, I have a hygrometer. It's eight inches of snow outside. My house is like 25 degrees humidity. It's also like 69 degrees because it's so, oil is so expensive. We keep our house insanely cold (laughs) this winter. Our tropical house plants that thrive in 80% humidity and full sun are not designed to thrive in the conditions that we put them in. Yes, they adjust. Yes, they become hardy. Yes, greenhouses kind of taper, like allow for them to adapt adapt to, you know, that transitional experience. But I think it's really realistic to understand that, of course, not all of the plants are going to make it because they weren't designed to live in your house, like plain and simple. So I think even just kind of giving yourself that, like to put the pin in the balloon and like just let a little bit of air out on the pressure of like, these plants really aren't meant to be indoors. And it's amazing that we care for them. And it's amazing that, you know, we figured out all of these amazing ways to have them thrive. But it's understandable that not all of them make it, number one, just in an indoor environment. And number two, with our personalities, with what types of plants work for us. And I think the point that you made is like some plants just genetically or like just the seed, you know, that particular plant is just not going to be as vigorous as another one. That's so interesting too, because the zebra plants, this is Haworthia that we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Like those are super hardy plants in general, I'd say of the succulent family. So that's also really interesting that that was your experience with that plant, which I feel like is, you know, one of the tried and trues. Yeah. Well, and it's one that like, if people want to grow succulents inside, that is the one to get because it's one that does work well in an indoor climate because it doesn't need a lot of light. It can go a long period of time without water. So it's one of the few that I feel like is fairly well suited to growing indoors, but most people are buying these echeverias or, you know, really colorful varieties that don't like a lot of water. So that's great if that's your care style, but they need a ton of light. And even on a windowsill, most of them aren't going to get enough light. And so I think that's the most common thing I see, like you're saying with people bringing plants inside and just assuming it's going to work. Your house is a very different climate than outside wherever it was naturally growing, or even just different than the greenhouse that it was being cultivated in before you bought it. There's so many changes when you move a plant into your space. And Deborah Lee Baldwin, 
that writes a lot about succulents, she also talks about how you have microclimates. And it's much more true outside where you have these little pockets of places that have a different climate, but it's true inside too. Like my office, because we have all these 3D printers running, it gets super hot. So everything in my office dries out a lot faster. Whereas in my kitchen, there's a lot more airflow and it's cooler and it it's just totally different. Like things don't need as much water in there. So paying attention to those different areas that you're growing in makes a big difference as well. Totally. What about the concept of, okay, I've just killed a plant. Am I going to get another plant and try again and learn? Or am I going to decide, you know what, this isn't the plant for me? And I can start when I moved to my first log cabin in the woods two years ago, I was hyper fixated on alocasia. And I was talking about it on the podcast a lot. I was like, I can't wait. I was living with my parents for six months. I was like, I'm moving. I can't wait to grow my plant collection. We got to this house. I had no idea how dark it was. It was so dark and so dry. And I still was like, I'm obsessed with alocasias. I want to do alocasias. I went and bought alocasias and then I quickly, oh, and I did this in the winter. I did this in January. Worst time to buy house plants, right? Under, you know, 10 inches of snow. And, you know, those alocasias like crisped up and died pretty quickly. And I think for me, it took two or three. I think the first one I was like, okay, that was just a oopsies, you know, like learning curve. The second one, I think I put it under glass, but then the glass didn't really work. I like I experimented. I I tried some different things. I tried to water it more and it still just wasn't looking very good. And then at that point, you know, I thought, okay, like maybe alocasia just aren't for me and that's okay. And yes, I like talked a big game about how I'm going to be like an alocasia girl now and that's okay. Like people can change and reality isn't as, you know, sometimes you dream something and the reality doesn't look the way you think it's going to be. What's your approach with that of when, when to learn to like let a whole genus go? Usually if I am growing one and it dies, I'll usually spend a little bit of time researching it. I pretty much exclusively grow succulents, so I will throw that out there. So at this point, I'm pretty familiar with most of the different um, genre, but I'll usually research that individual plant or the genre or the genus that it's in and just see if it's probably my fault that it died or if it's maybe just it, like you're saying, it's just the environment and I, I can't provide that environment that actually plays a really big role now in the plants that I buy where it's like, Oh, I can tell that, you know, this one is probably not going to, it's, it's going to take a lot of extra work for it to thrive in my climate. And I don't want to put that extra work in. So I think there's a balance there. If you kill one, maybe figure out why you killed it and learn a little bit more about it and decide if you can make a few adjustments and you think you can keep growing it. Awesome. Go for it. But If as you dive into it, you realize like, oh, this needs a high humidity climate. My house is super dry. It's probably not a good one to repeat purchase unless you just want to treat it like it's, you know, like cut flowers of sorts, right? If you buy it with the intent that it will die, you'll care for it however best you can. But in the end, it's not going to survive. My mother-in-law does that with orchids. She's like, I love orchids and they cost the same as a bouquet of flowers. And I throw away the bouquet of flowers at the end. So I'm just going to do that with orchids. Just let it bloom as long as it will and then let it go at that point. Not stress about needing it to rebloom. Yeah, I think it's a mindset thing totally as well. If you do have one, you know, if you bring a plant home and you kill it and you decide that you want to try again and tinker with things, I think the next time that you bring it home, you need to kind of have a more gentler approach of being like, this could work or this could. Like, we're in an experimental phase and we're going to play with our curiosity and we're going to let this be fun and see if it works instead of like being so hard on yourself if, oh my God, it's the second time I tried to care for this plant and it didn't work. Like, I think... I think we all are just like so much harder on ourselves. Like that's self-talk, man. No one is as mean to you as you are, you know? So like allowing that mindset shift. And then also the mindset of being like, just like what you said, you know what? This is a beautiful plant. This plant would do so great in my friend's house, but for my house, it's just not going to work. And that's okay. And I can still love that plant. And that's cool. Maybe I'll buy the plant for my friend, right? Or if I'm ever given an allocation or if I buy an allocation, I go, oops, I did it again. 
this plant isn't going to work for me, but I know that my friend has an Ikea grow cabinet that's super humid and, you know, perfect for an allocation. Maybe that's an opportunity to gift it. So another thing I wanted to chat with you about is, you know, I think there's a lot of power in recognizing a plant fail is coming, like recognizing a plant death is coming. And maybe you identify, hey, you know, you're actually in this space right now where you've identified, hey, my collection has gotten way too big for me. I'm reducing. How do you reduce? Are you tossing stuff? Are you gifting stuff? What are the different ways that, you know, people can kind of reduce their collections if they need to once they've made those assessments? Yeah. So this, I think there's a little bit of mindset involved with this too, because sometimes I'm like, well, if I'm giving a plant away, why would somebody else want it? Especially if it's not in like tip top health, right? But if it's still good enough where it can keep growing, like you're saying, it's easy enough to say, okay, I'm downsizing. Who wants a new plant? So usually I was going to say, usually I'll start with friends. I think at this point, I'm pretty aware that most of my friends don't want more plants. I know, me too. They're like, enough, Maria. <laughs> no more, no more. Or, yeah. you know, or they're afraid they'll kill it. And I remind them, like, I have more. I can replace it in a few right. weeks if it dies. One of my favorite ways, though, honestly, is our local Buy Nothing group on Facebook. So I think they have these all over the place and yes. they may not be in the same form, but I will just put a little table out on my porch and put a bunch of succulents or plants, you know, in pots out there. And sometimes I just do the pots if I have extra pots and just set them out and take a picture and say, Hey, anyone who wants to come, you know, come pick up a few pots. And it's awesome because then I don't even have to travel beyond my front porch and someone else is super happy that they get this new plant. Another way I've done it, which I realize not everyone has this option, is every once in a while I'll do like a giveaway for our Succulent Lovers Club. I actually just did this a few weeks ago where I have a ton of Haworthias that have a bunch of babies. And so we did a, a repotting party and I unpotted this succulent and had people guess how many babies were in it. And then I gave away some of the babies to whoever guessed the closest. And so that that was fun too. But I think just looking for plant groups, asking neighbors, asking friends, and if you can't find people, just totally letting them go is also okay. One other place that I have gifted them, not as frequently, but a lot of times schools, especially elementary schools or middle schools, will want plants that they can you know, do a workshop on with their kids, or some of them will have a little garden space. So that's another fun one, too, that you can kind of donate you could also sell same thing like through Facebook marketplace or Craigslist or something. I know people will buy succulents and I'm sure other plants through Facebook groups and different things. If you want to try and recoup some of your costs. I've heard um, of people going to their local nursing homes as well and Ooh, gifting yeah. them to nursing homes, which I think is super sweet restaurants, right? I feel like there's 10 restaurants in my town where if I brought some plants to them, they'd be like, oh my God, thank you. This would be so great. And then another thought, you know, something that I've thought, and this is like a little deep, but like something I've thought and meditated on too, on like death, like when we lose someone, but also with plants is like in the woods, you know, I'm surrounded by woods now, you know, you see a fallen tree, but then you realize that that fallen tree decomposes and turns into the nutrients that feed the trees around it, or it decomposes and becomes a habitat for the other animals in the forest. And, you know, that tree can become something else. If you have compost available to you, like composting those plants in order to use them for, you know, use that fertilizer, that compost for your garden. I just got a tabletop composter, the Lomi that I'm obsessed with that, you know, actually turns stuff into dirt. It turns the Lomi like will turn your food scraps into dirt that you can pot stuff up in. But I also think, you know, if you have compost available to you, like there's something very poetic in that or the garbage. Obvi obviously you want to try and reduce your waste. We have woods too. So I'm known now to just like fling a plant into the woods and be like, return to the earth, like return to from whence you've came. But, um, you know, I think it's another mindset of figuring out, okay, it's time for me to not have this plant, but like, what is the next iteration of this plant, whether it's being with someone or whether it's, you know, returning to the earth or just like, you know, 
flushing your fish down the toilet. Like just, you know, it's just like the next season of life. And sometimes too, like a plant death, you know, I recently let go of all of my ferns. So my first public TV, live TV appearance was on Access Live in 2020. And I had to do this like presentation for Mario Lopez. And, um, I had to go out and buy ferns for this presentation because I didn't have any because I know myself and I know that ferns don't thrive in my life. And I bought a bird's nest fern and a blue star fern and um, a maiden hair fern and I think an asparagus fern and I needed it for this presentation. And then for the last two years, like I've spent a lot of time trying to keep these plants alive. I bought terrariums, like I bought glass domes cloches to try and keep my ferns alive. Like I've done my best. I did my best. I had an emotional attachment to those plants because I'm like, these are my access lot. These are my Mario Lopez plants. Like these plants are my reminder that I was on national TV. How great. And, you know, recently I just kind of let go of them and I just looked at them. They didn't look happy. I hated having to water them. Like I hated having to special bottom water the bird's nest fern and when I don't bottom water the majority of my other plants. And, um, you know, it felt kind of freeing to just be like, okay, like I release you and everything's okay. And like, you know, I understand I was attached because of that experience, but that once these plants are gone, doesn't really mean anything. (laughs) Like I still have my YouTube video of like me being on TV. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, and it's interesting because one of the things that I have noticed, especially over the last few weeks as I'm working on like whittling down my collection, there's a lot with plants dying that relates really well to decluttering. And I have a really good friend who teaches people how to declutter and helps them declutter. And there's been a couple of times where she'll post on Facebook. She's like, it's okay to just throw it in the trash. You don't have to repurpose, reuse, recycle everything. And obviously I think there's like a balance to it, but I think we get so much of that pressure in our head where we're like, I can't throw it away. I spent money on it or, you know, it's, it's just going to waste. And then you kind of have to think, but like how much mental space is it taking up? How much stress and anxiety is it adding to my life that's causing waste in other ways? And, you know, just being able to let it go. I like to think that the plants that I put in the trash are helping with the composting. My composting efforts have not been very good. So that's why I think so. To end up going in the trash more that way. But yeah, I think it does really come down to a, a lot of it's just a mindset thing of figuring out how is it going to feel comfortable for you to let this go? What's the easiest way for you to do it? And then just move forward. Just take the plunge. Yeah. That reminded me something. First off, you reminded me why I brought up my fern story. Cause at the end I was like, why the hell did I just tell the story? It was because I got rid of the three ferns it made space for me to bring in plants that I actually wanted to take care of. Like it got to the point where I was not enjoying the ferns anymore. They were stressing me out. They didn't look good. I wasn't enjoying them. I threw them in the woods (laughs) and then I brought back like Hoya and I love my Hoya and I'm having so much more fun. I'm exploring that genus right now. So I'm really enjoying, you know, doing that, but I didn't want to expand my plant collection. So I was holding on to these ferns that weren't bringing me joy, that were stressing me out. And because I didn't want to get more plants, I wasn't able to bring those new Hoya in. But when I was able to let go of those ferns, I was able to bring in some new stuff. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is from an investment standpoint, I think a lot about, and this is also because I'm really good at rationalizing purchasing of clothes, but cost per wear is something that you talk about when you're buying shoes or you're buying clothes, you know, okay, this dress costs $100, but I'm going to wear it, you know, 10 or 15 times. So really the dress costs 10, you know, to $15 a wear. And if you think about that with a plant, you spend $20 on a plant and you have that plant for 365 days or years on end. If you think about the cost per day of enjoying the plant and the the positive time that you spent with it. I think that's also a nice way of reframing when you get really attached to, oh my God, this plant costs so much money. But I also think what you just said, what I just wrote down is that mental, the mental clutter, the mental cost of holding onto something that doesn't serve you anymore. Yeah. Well, and I think of it a lot, a lot like food. I mean, obviously you can grow plants that can be food, But we spend so much money every month on food that nourishes us physically, right? 
And I think to your point of having this plant that you can enjoy for however long it's alive, to me, that's a lot of mental and kind of spiritual nourishment that you're getting from it. I, I think we just don't see it in the same way because we're not like physically consuming the plants the same way we do food. Yeah, interesting. But it really is the same way. Like it's it's a different type of medicine, if you will, that just helps you feel good. And so if it's not doing that, get rid of it. <laughs> um, right. And, if you're buying it to make you feel it to make you feel good and it's not making you feel good, what the hell are you doing? Yep. Totally. I think what you said, I mean, I think what you said, this whole conversation is so interesting. And I think this conversation around, you know, plant death and plant fails and that you don't need to make it mean something about you. I remember in my book, that's like a, the chapter that I have on plant death is like, when you kill a plant, you have two options. Option one is to let it mean something about you and like kind of ruin or affect your relationship with all of your plants or two, just view it as a learning opportunity and marvel in like the positive effect that that one plant death could have on your entire, you know, collection. And I think, you know, something we've both kind of touched on is this concept of seasons and, you know, our plants go through seasons. We experience seasons. I'm sitting watching so much snow come down outside my window as we're talking right now. And we experience those seasons too. It's very natural to go in and out of cycles where you are obsessed with your plants and then you're in another season where you forget to water them and they all get mealybugs and you're like, wait, what the hell? <laughs> I'm supposed to be good at this. But you are good at this. You're just in a different season of life. You have the capacity. Everybody has the capacity to be a plant parent, right? It's just about the right timing. Yeah, for sure. Something else I've seen kind of along that line too, is also just, I feel like plants in general help us connect with other people. And I know for me personally, the idea that my plant is dying makes me think that people are going to think I'm a horrible person or, you know, past yeah. judgment. Yeah. While that may exist, it's been so fascinating when I have shared like a YouTube video or an email about my succulents that died, I get so many responses from people saying like, oh, thank you for sharing this. Now I feel so much better that this plant that I have died, or I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. And oddly, I feel like for as many connections as I've made with people through the plants I'm growing, I've made just as many connections from the plants that have died and having that yes. like, authenticity to say, dang it, I just killed this plant I spent 30 bucks on. And someone's like, yeah, I spent a hundred dollars on a plant once and it died and it was so frustrating. And and it's just, it's another way I think of connecting on a little bit deeper level too. Oh my God. That's so beautiful and so real. And plants are so emotional. I mean, every person I meet, every call I get on when people say, what do you do? And I say, I have a podcast about houseplants and gardening. There are such polarizing responses. I either get, oh my God, I need your podcast. I kill every plant and I'm so bad at all this negative. I'm so bad at this. I'm a plant killer. Or oh my God, let me tell you everything about my plant collection right now. You know, like there's that connection and that polarity almost on either side. And yeah, I think that authenticity, I think that human connection over the positive and the negative is just a beautiful means for feeling seen, right? Feeling seen and, and being connected with someone. So Sweet listeners, sweet plant friends, you're not a failure. We hope that we've given you some actionable things that you can kind of walk away. And the next time you you experience a plant death, hopefully you can kind of shift your mindset. Cassidy, you have so much to offer in the plant space. If people don't already read your blog and, you know, subscribe to your new letter, newsletter and a part of your community, like where can everyone find you and and start getting their succulent nerd on? Yes. Well, the best place is at succulentsandsunshine.com or we're at succulents and sunshine. I think everywhere else, um, probably the website and YouTube are the two main places where you'll get the most information. Perfect. We'll have them all linked in the show notes. Thank you so much, my friend, for having this wonderful, fun, honest, vulnerable conversation. And also for your, our budding friendship too. It's been so nice getting to know you this year. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. It's been awesome. Thank you so much to Cassidy. She is so awesome. If you are a succulent lover, she is literally your one-stop shop for 
all your succulent needs. She has courses. She has a succulent-focused community, which we talked about. Her blog, she has blogs on everything succulents you could ever dream of. It's succulentsandsunshine.com. Um, all of her socials and, and YouTube and everything is also linked in the show notes. Thank you so much to our amazing episode sponsors. Make sure that you support them if you need any of those products. And thank you, Plant Friends. I'm so excited. We're finally rebranded. I cannot tell you. I'm so excited for the episodes that we have coming up. So make sure that you're subscribed because we're hitting you every week with new episodes. So if you're you know, an, a longtime listener, that's more than you're used to. So make sure you're subscribed. We have some incredible conversations lined up. I am so excited to continue growing alongside this community and growing our plants successfully, but growing ourselves successfully. So until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will 
will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm -hmm. 